Hello everyone, welcome back to Swedenborgian uh, Community Online. Today we are diving back into Swedenborgianism uh, and what this 18th century mystic Emanuel Swedenborg thought about God. Uh, today we are specifically exploring uh, some interesting facets of heaven and God as the sun, or at least surrounded by the spiritual sun. Um, Interestingly enough, Swedenborg believed that was just what appeared to angels, what appeared to people in the afterlife as the sun. People still have bodies, according to him, in the spiritual world, although they're kind of trippy spiritual bodies. And they have environments that represent their internal state. And so, you know, those who are seeing the sun, they're in a pretty good place because the sun is the emanation of love and wisdom from the Lord. But we'll explore that a little bit more and see if it makes sense. Uh, some sense to us. Okay, our first section uh, that we're going to dive into is the beginning of part two of his book, Divine Love and Wisdom. Now, we are not going to slowly step through this book. We're going to fly through. So, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend trying to follow along, but just note that the table of contents are a good place to start when uh, summarizing through a text like this. Uh, and if you do want to follow along, I, I recommend starting there. So this first section is uh, entitled, In the Spiritual World, Divine Love and Wisdom Look Like a Sun. And we're going to open with a reading uh, from this section from Swedenborg. There are two worlds, one spiritual and one physical. And the spiritual world does not derive anything from the physical one nor does the physical one derive anything from the spiritual one. They are completely distinct from each other, communicating only by means of correspondence, whose nature has been amply explained elsewhere. So I'll, I'll just mention now, correspondence, according to Swedenborg, is almost like a, the parallel nature of the spiritual world and the physical world. You know, it's kind of like if you had... Um, you know, a trip on psychedelics or something, and you were seeing a spiritual realm, <clears throat> often there's trees, right? That's what people say. They see beings and crazy environments, and, and it's like a dream, right? They walk around or fly or something. Um, and Swedenborg actually says, that's, that's real, that's true. In the spiritual realm, there's actually um, these analogs to the, the physical realm. So you'll have an environment, you'll have... Uh, the sun, as we mentioned, clouds, storms, and um, interestingly enough, it often means something deep about our spiritual state, which I think is often also how we feel if we do have a spiritual experience and, and we end up in these different types of environments. So let's continue reading. The following example may be enlightening. Warmth in the physical world is the equivalent of the good that thoughtfulness does in the spiritual world. And light in the physical world is the equivalent of the truth that faith perceives in the spiritual world. So he's saying warmth and light in the physical world are like this goodness and um, truth or, or faith or awareness in the spiritual world. And, and I think we can relate to that because, you know, we often talk that way. We say someone was warm. You know, someone's warm to us. This is a warm environment. Not necessarily because it's actually warm. <laughs> it's about that feeling of compassion and love. And then, of course, light is the biggest one. You know, we say a light went off in our head when we have a realization. And when we see things clearly and we're talking about our minds, we're, we're not talking about actual light. We're talking about a type of mental light of awareness. He also says no one can fail to see that warmth and the goodness of being thoughtful and light and the truth of faith are completely distinct from each other. So that's an interesting thing he mentions. They're distinct, but as we saw in our first video on this, he also talks about how they're one. And that actually follows physical laws. Uh, as we know from physics, light and warmth seemingly distinct. And, and in a way they are. They have different effects. We're talking about, um, you know, things that we can define as separate, but they are actually one thing. And the physical reality of it, um, you know, and, and light has has very interesting properties like that, being light and warmth, being a wave and also kind of like a particle. 
Um, so it's interesting that someone from the 1700s is writing about this, uh, you know, already. So let's jump ahead and read a little bit more from Swedenborg. In spite of the fact that they are so distinct from each other, though, they still make a single whole by means of their correspondence. They are so united that when we read about warmth and light in the word, the spirits and angels who are with us see thoughtfulness in the place of warmth and faith in the place of light. So you'll notice he's not a faith alone type of guy. He he thinks your faith should have some real warmth behind it. And in fact, of course, Swedenborg being the mystical thinker he was and also a groundbreaking one at that, uh, he believed that many types of people, many cultures, even aliens, uh, connect with heaven, go to heaven, if they choose to. Uh, choose to center themselves on love of God, which is, in a sense, love for God's properties, love for deep awareness, love for humanity, humaneness, love for caring, love for compassion, love for sharing, caring and thoughtfulness with each other, uplifting each other, etc. So he thought, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're Christian or not, or not, if you have this type of love, this type of centeredness, or if you're willing to develop it in this life or the next. So I think that's an interesting place to, to pause for a moment because we're hearing this uh, spaciousness in his afterlife. I think a lot of times, I don't know, I, I don't know what your background is, of course, <laughs> but when you hear about heaven growing up, if you're if you're not from a Swedenborgian you know, church or something, or maybe another tradition that, that kind of explores it this way, often you don't know what to think. You think of people worshiping God forever. Um, you know, maybe we're like clouds. Maybe it's just an awareness type of thing. Uh, maybe we just lose who we are and, and become the infinite or, or become nothing, of course. Many people believe that. Uh, Swedenborg's saying that we actually keep some semblance of uh, our uh, subjective point of view, at least, but we start to become more and more aware of God and the objective reality from God, from God's light and heat, uh, which are God's wisdom and love. And so both together make us into the spiritual beings that we are now and also um, the spiritual beings we're to become. And indeed, if we're willing to really lean into it, and he'll, he'll explore this in a few minutes, uh, we become angels. In fact, Swedenborg believed angels were not some, you know, made species that just had to follow God's bidding, uh, but were people or, or aliens uh, that centered themselves in love to such an extent that they enter this kingdom, this queendom, this realm of heaven. Um, and so that's, that's pretty cool. There's still a level of freedom. In fact, you find true freedom when you're really a compassionate being, Swedenborg believed. So jumping ahead, he writes, Warmth and light emanates from the sun that arises from divine love and wisdom. So this sun is divine love and wisdom in the spiritual realm. And that's where this warmth and light comes from. Indeed, just like our sun, Swedenborg describes this spiritual sun or this divine sun, if you will, um, as being kind of a raging fire, like beyond comprehension, right? We, we think we have an understanding of our sun and we hardly do in, in a real sense. You know, we can't really experience it close up uh, without being destroyed or, or what have you. And that's true with every sun. And for Swedenborg, the spiritual sun is the source of why suns throughout the universe are the source of heat and light. In fact, the physical realm uh, is a semblance of the spiritual realm because the spiritual realm is where the truer reality is. Uh, so it's an interesting concept, but you'll, you'll hear it a lot from people that in their spiritual experiences, they feel more real than the material experiences. And I think part of that is that when you feel light and warmth from God as a sun, or at least the, the sun that God is um, within, that God's emanating for everyone's health, um, it, you know, you, you really feel that environment, that, that spiritual environment, and it means something to you. If you're in the sun, uh, if you're facing the sun of the spiritual realm, 
that's because you're spiritually facing that love, like you're really centered in it. Uh, whereas in this world, you could be as close to the sun as you want to be. It doesn't mean anything necessarily about your heart. So that's an interesting you know, thing to note. And um, it's also fascinating that that's where all these symbols in the spiritual world, in the physical world, um, have their meaning and come from. You know, a lot of times we say, well, the physical laws create all this stuff and it's kind of random, but it, it just works perfectly from, from the smallest to the biggest. Maybe that's because there's a bunch of parallel universes. Maybe that's because, you know, it, it just happened a trillion, billion, infinite times and we happen to be in the, the perfect one. Uh, Swedenborg would, would ask, well, where, why is it happening again and again? Where's the impetus to happen comes from? Uh, but I think he would also go further and say, no, actually, the universe is made purposefully, um, not in the sense of a lot of creationists per se. He wasn't exactly a creationist in that way, uh, but in the sense that God is within all scientific processes and all the levels of creation. And so um, this, this thing that we see throughout the, the universe, planets circling the sun, actually are grounded in the reality of the spiritual world and the fact that there's a spiritual sun um, that is essentially the, the perfect symbol of what fire often is, a place of comfort and warmth, and, um, and that we in our spiritual state actually create different communities, kind of like different places on earth or different planets uh, based on our love and our differences in love. And we'll find more out about that as we jump ahead. He writes here, The sun is not God. Rather, it is an emanation from the divine love and wisdom of the divine human one. And he capitalizes that because that's God, according to Swedenborg. The same is true of warmth and light from that sun. Now he calls God the divine human one because he thinks everything that makes us human is from God. Just like in the creation story, it said, we are made in the image and likeness of God. Now he takes the definition of human a little broader because to him, everything that's compassionate and loving is a human characteristic in this broadened term. So you could say everything's a little bit human in the sense if it conveys or centers itself in love and wisdom. And so aliens are human in the same sense. Uh, so he's not really talking uh, in, in terms of species here, but more in a kind of transcendent definition of what it means to be human. Let's read on. The sun that angels see, quote unquote, the sun that gives them warmth and light, does not mean the Lord himself. It means that first emanation from him that is the highest form of spiritual warmth. The highest form of spiritual warmth is spiritual fire, which is divine love and wisdom in its first correspondential form. This is why that sun looks fiery and also is fiery for angels, though it is not for us. What we experience as fire is not spiritual but physical, and the difference between these two is like the difference between life and death. The spiritual sun then brings spiritual people to life with its warmth and maintains spiritual things while the physical sun does the same for physical people and things. It does not do this with its own power, though, but by an inflow of spiritual warmth that provides it with effective resources. And he writes, The spiritual fire where light dwells and its origin becomes a spiritual warmth and light that decrease as they emanate, with the decrease occurring by levels that will be discussed later. So kind of like, you know, our sun. Uh, light decreases or heat, heat and light decreases as you go further away. The ancients pictured this as brightly gleaming circles of reddish fire around the head of God, a form of representation that is still common today when God is portrayed as human in painting. So yeah, we see this in a lot of paintings and, and it's also done with saints and, and what have you, uh, that, that circle around the head to represent holiness and it's kind of like this emanating sphere <laughs> so it's funny the, the aura tradition might have its root in something uh, real in the spiritual world according to Swedenborg and as he explores in other places he he does think he, he did believe that 
people, their spiritual bodies, um, had auras that emanated and shared a different spiritual thing. So uh, it's interesting to think about, but uh, it's cool that there's that connection uh, so readily. And then to finish this section off, he writes, It is obvious from actual experience that love generates warmth and wisdom generates light. When we feel love, we become warmer. And when we think from wisdom, it is like seeing things in the light. We can see from this that the first thing that emanates from love is warmth and that the first thing that emanates from wisdom is light. Okay. All right. Well, Swedenborg made his case. Uh, let's, let's see if, if he can carry us along. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. Do you think that this is true, that this is a spiritual environment that uh, speaks to you? He, he points out that human beings are so accustomed. In fact, all beings are so accustomed to having a body, to having environments. That's also a reason why it's like that in the, the next life. It's it's a continuation. It's um, God doesn't force tremendous spiritual change onto us. Uh, well, sometimes there's moments where we, we grow tremendously, but uh, we, we're given a spiritual freedom and environments, having a body, being able to connect with people, to learn things, to speak, uh, to grow and, and, and explore uh, is a good symbol for a spiritual journey and Swedenborg makes the point, there's a good reason for this. That's how everything works. Everything is a symbol. Indeed, our you know, modern day uh, linguistics and, and psychotherapists will tell us human beings think in uh, symbols. That's how we think. That's how our mind's made uh, to connect dots. And indeed, our universe seems to be kind of like a hologram of itself. The small things speak to the big things. The big things have these fascinating properties that are similar to the smallest things. Um, and so this type of symbolism uh, is inherent within uh, the universe and, and our earth itself. He also writes, the spiritual warmth and light that result from the emanation from the Lord as the sun from a single whole form a single whole, just as his divine love and wisdom do. And we talked about that before, that these things form a one, just like in the physical realm, light and heat form a one. And now we know on a, on a minute physical level that that's true as well, not just that the sun provides both together, but that they are one and properties of um, a specific uh, energetic uh, interaction that actually, in a sense, is um, connected to the energy of all things. All matter is made of energy, just in different forms different properties, uh, partly due to the different connections uh, of different types of forms that the energy comes into. So we're composite energetic forms. You know, it's funny, when I was young, people would say, oh, it's all energy. And, and a lot of folks would be, oh, that's just, that's just woo-woo, man. Like, <laughs> um, if you're not a hippie, a lot of times you just dismiss it, right? And my dad's still a hippie, so I, I, I love it. But um, it's funny because we know now from science, uh, we're learning that actually creation, all physical matter is energetic and indeed spacious. Uh, most things are filled with space. And so, you know, that concept of, of being aware of the delusion of the physical realm, that there's something truer within our consciousness, with, within consciousness itself, uh, you know, that, that speaks um, to us on many levels and it also speaks from many different traditions, not just uh, Swedenborg or, or Christianity. Now, uh, in section 103, if, if you're one of those crazy people who's trying to jump along, uh, the sun of the spiritual world is seen at a middle elevation, as far from angels as our physical world sun is from us. Okay. Well, he must have a point to, to pointing out that the the sun of the spiritual world is at a middle elevation, so kind of like, you know, a certain height, and maybe that way it's never really blocked or, or you know, not too too hot or something. Let's 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 read. Many people bring with them from our world an image of God as high overhead, and of the Lord as being in heaven among its angels. 
The reason they bring an image of God as high overhead is that God is called most high, reasonable, right, in the word. And it says that he lives on high. This is why we lift up our eyes and our hands when we pray and worship, unaware that highest means inmost. Okay, so getting, getting mystical again here, Swedenborg. The reason people bring along an image of the Lord as being in heaven among its angels is that they think of him only as being like any other individual or like an angel. They do not realize that the Lord is the real and only God, the one who rules the universe. And of course, Swedenborg believed that because the Lord is the real and only God, that's the same God that speaks through all the healthy spiritualities throughout time. Yes, indeed, throughout history and throughout different worlds. Uh, you know, he didn't believe uh, that you had to in, like, specifically believe in one historical figure to enter heaven. Now, he did believe that there are a lot of things about Christ and understanding that God is one in Christ that helps the process along and that you may have to learn before you enter heaven in the afterlife. So he, there's some caveats there. But most of those tend to have to do with realizing that God is a whole and that we, re, we realize ourselves, that we get everything that's great uh, about ourselves from divinity. And so in a sense, everything and everyone is whole. And he also believed that it's important to know that God is essentially human, a divine human, where we get our humanity from. And part of the reason he thought that, not only because he thought it was true, but because humans, when you think of someone to worship or to connect with uh, deep within, we can't help but thinking in human-like terms. Uh, and when we try to disconnect God from humanity in that sense, uh, we start to undermine God in terms of God's intentionality, in terms of God's wisdom and compassion. You know, those are human things, uh, things that humans have come up with uh, in terms of defining it and thinking about them. Uh, and the Bible, the Quran, other traditions talk about God being wise and compassionate and loving, uh, conscious. Uh, but when we start to force that division between human nature and God, uh, sometimes we remove these human things from God and then we disconnect ourselves from having a deeper connection and awareness uh, of divinity itself. Okay, so where were we? He says the reason people bring along an image of the Lord as being in heaven amongst his angels is that they think of him only as being like an, any other individual or like an angel. We read that. Uh, they do not realize that the Lord is the real and only God, the one who rules the universe. If he were living in heaven among the angels, he could not keep the universe under his sight and hold it in his care and keeping. If he were not shining like the sun on the people in the spiritual world, angels could not have any light. Angels, that is, are spiritual beings. So only spiritual light is suited to their essence. When I discuss levels later, we will see that there is a light in the heavens that is far, far greater than our light on earth. As for the sun that is the source of angels' warmth and light, they see it at about 45 degree angle above the lands where they live at a middle elevation. It also seems to be about as far from angels as this world's sun is from us. They see the sun at the, that height and distance constantly. It does not move. They, this is why angels do not have stretches of time marked off into days and years or any daily progression from morning through noon to evening and on into night. They do not have a yearly sequence from spring through summer to autumn and on into winter either. Instead, they have a constant daylight and constant springtime, which means that instead of times, they have states, as already noted. He says the following are the primary reasons why the sun of the spiritual world is seen at a middle elevation. First, this means that the warmth and light that emanate from that sun are at their median level. They are of equal proportions. Therefore, and appropriately moderate. So he's saying if the sun were up here, maybe too, 
too warm compared to the light if it were too low maybe too bright compared to the warmth kind of like in the morning so middle elevation get it about equally okay well it's interesting to to think about that god even in the spiritual realm wants to balance wisdom with compassion and indeed they should come together as swedenborg has described the next section he writes the distance between the sun and angels in the spiritual world is an apparent distance that depends on their acceptance of divine love and wisdom so if you feel like you're if you seem further away from that spiritual sun or if you never see it it's because you're not accepting it god doesn't force people into hell or, or something where uh, they're just tortured no people don't accept love and wisdom and so they enter these darker places on their own and, and that's what they are that's what they love within or think they love uh, until hopefully they they grow out of it or, or find um, a greater love and, and wisdom in their lives jumping ahead again to explore this a little further he writes angels are in the lord and the lord is in them and since angels are vessels the lord alone is heaven heaven is called god's dwelling and god's throne so people think that god lives there like a monarch in a realm so yeah i think this kind of gets at the root of how we often think of heaven and hell this kind of judgmental place of you know dismissal and uh, acceptance based on you know what what religion you you put on your shirt right i believed in jesus go to heaven you're a loving person you believe in god but you're you're muslim you didn't quite get the the historical jesus so you're going to hell like that's often what people think uh, but i think he starts to make the point here that we are vessels of god we receive god and god doesn't rule as like a king in the sense that you know he's just casting down judgments and things like that uh, but more in the sense that god is infused in everything so you enter heaven as you receive more of god you you know choose hell as you refuse to receive more of god you're still conscious to a degree from god and everything you got working is, is from god but you're centering on uh, what he describes as a love of self so this kind of inward navel gazing selfishness that is put at the top of everything else you do that it's the center of your being and he considers that to be the opposite of loving god um, and so that loving god must have something to do with loving other people as christ often said loving enemies loving all beings uh, and so that seems to make sense but you know when i think about it for myself you know sometimes it's like well how do i know if i'm super selfish or not i work at it i try to have some spiritual practices or what or whatnot i try to learn but how do we know well i think it does take work so there is a process and indeed swedenborg believed that in the afterlife there is still a process in this place called the world of spirits that we'll read about um, but i think leaning into these godly attributes whatever our tradition you know finding an idea of god that makes sense to us that speaks to us one that doesn't you know make us pull god's intentionality god's wisdom god's love from god so that we're centering on a place of compassion on a divine uh, awareness and and love i think that's a good place to start according to swedenborg and then realizing that our selfishness doesn't serve us and not only does it not serve us it's delusion because in all we are one with god and so being you know pointedly selfish uh, is actually buying into the delusion that we are apart and alone um, and buying into our subjectivity instead of becoming more aware that it is a subjective state we, we're not our bodies and that there's something greater uh, going on that we are intrinsically linked to because that is our consciousness our awareness itself is from god is that light from uh, the spiritual heaven all right he writes in this section heaven is called god's dwelling and god's throne so people think that god lives there like a monarch in a realm however god that is the lord is in the sun above the heavens and is in the heavens by means of his presence in warmth and light 
as I have explained in the last two sections. Further, even though the Lord is present in heaven and in, in this apparently distant way, he is still also intrinsically present there, so to speak, since I have just explained uh, above, the distance between the sun and heaven is not a distance, but a virtual distance. Now, we didn't cover that place, but that distance that you might kind of imagine between you and the spiritual sun, it's a virtual distance. It has to do with your limited receptivity of God's light and warmth, as we, we kind of did cover that part. But that virtual distance is just an appearance. Um, now, it's funny that he says virtual distance when... We're all virtually, you know, virtual distancing, right? Nowadays, or at least we have been. Uh, but he's writing this hundreds of years ago, so he's he's just keyed in to the times. He just he just knows what's going on, and we we do connect distantly through Zoom. But despite the apparent distance between you and me, you know, we may be closer in terms of spiritual warmth than uh, we could imagine uh, in terms of, you know caring for other people, having similar desires and goals as, as human beings. So let's keep reading. So it's only apparent then, um, and the Lord himself is in the heaven. He is in the love and wisdom of heaven's angels. And since he is in the love and wisdom of all the angels and the angels made, make up heaven, he is in all of heaven. So again, angels are just people in heaven, according to Swedenborg. Things, beings in heaven. Um, humans in heaven, even if they're aliens, with his weird... Uh, good definition, I think, because he's getting to the heart of what it means to be a sentient being. He's saying there's actually this shared consciousness in our diversity, in our cultural diversity. I'm sure it's very different between uh, our planet and probably the untold... A uh, number of planets filled with, uh, you know, sentient life similar to us. But there's that sharedness, that shared aspect of, of um, consciousness and love and wisdom and its ver infinite variety, right? God is infinite. Um, and so that's, that's cool, uh, to me at least. Now he writes, the reason the Lord is not only in heaven, but actually is heaven itself, is that love and wisdom make an angel. And these two are properties of the Lord in the angels. It therefore follows that the Lord is heaven. So that distance that we might have felt imagining God as a son, we're realizing, okay, God's not just appearing in the, as a son or within a son. God is within all the beings of heaven and in fact is heaven because everything that is heaven is from God. All the warmth, all the light, all the energy, right, that makes up even a spiritual body, um, perhaps more so because it's more connected to that love and wisdom, that, that spiritual warmth and light is from God, is God, according to Swedenborg. Uh, so that selfishness truly is a deluded state because it's not aware of the oneness of the reality of, of being itself. Now our next section starts with the East in the spiritual world is where the Lord is seen as the sun and the other directions follow from that so if this happened to be the spiritual world uh, and we had the spiritual sun above that would be east you would be facing the spiritual sun i would be facing away because you know who has need for wisdom right whatever <laughs> who, who who needs to love I, i'm a cold being right that's often our centeredness away from God, it's in that coldness of heart and spirit that we can often fall into, you know, not all the time, but a little bit here and there. Uh, and so that's East. And what's interesting is that Swedenborg connects this to the use of East in the Bible. Uh, Swedenborg believed not every book of the Bible, by the way, but most of the books of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, that's four, and then Revelation, that's the fifth, were the ones that were in this deep symbolism that had connections with the reality of the spiritual world. So if you're reading the creation story and the light shines, that's a spiritual symbol. It's a parable. Just like it says Jesus always spoke in parable, right? We remember those parables. We have no issue with that. Well, Swedenborg is saying God is speaking through all these books of the Bible just as God always did, as it says, speak in parable. He spoke in parable. And so here, the east is defined as facing God. And so in the Bible, when it mentions the east, it has something to do with facing 
that deeper love, that deeper wisdom of God or, or coming from it if it's a wind from the east, right? Uh, so we, we see that in scripture used pretty consistently in that way. Uh, and he believed it was rooted in the spiritual reality of the spiritual realm. Now, the next section starts, the regions in the spiritual world are not caused by the Lord as the sun, but by the angels, depending on their receptivity. So here he explores how, you know, our communities in heaven kind of differ depending on our differing receptivity of love and wisdom, kind of like different beings shine in the sun differently or use the energy from the sun, from the, the plants and, and animals that we eat. Um, differently for different purposes. The communities in heaven come together through their difference in similar ways. How they receive it, how they use it, their shared interests and loves. Kind of like how if you think of different countries, um, you know, throughout the world, there tends to be shared things about them. And Swedenborg thought that was true in the afterlife as well, in the spiritual world, that it's actually a reality for us today. We're just not aware of our connectedness to it. Um, and that there are communities in that realm uh, that are, are uh, different, just like in this realm. He writes, I have stated that angels live in distinct regions, some in the east, some in the west, some in the south, and some in the north. I've also stated that the ones who live in the east are engaged in a higher level of love, those in the west in a lower level of love, those in the south in the light of wisdom, and those in the north in the shadow of wisdom. This variation of place seems to be caused by the Lord as the sun, yet it is actually caused by the angels, you know, themselves. I added that word. The Lord is not at a greater or lesser degree of love and wisdom as the sun. He is not at a greater or lesser level of warmth and light for one person than for another. Just like in the Bible, it says the sun shines on all things equally. Um, Swedenborg is actually making the point that that's truest in the spiritual realm because God is trying to convey all heat and light to everyone, but we receive it differently. That distance is, is a virtual distance. It's not a real distance, but it does have some meaning with how we're receiving God, how we're choosing, or you know, how we develop to receive God. He is everywhere the same, he writes. However, he is not accepted at the same level by one person as by another. And this makes it seem as though they are more or less distant from each other in a variety of regions. It follows from this that the regions in the spiritual world are simply variations in the receptivity of love and wisdom, and therefore of the warmth and light of the Lord as the sun. Okay, Swedenborg. All right, I'll take your word for it. Now, we don't just have to take Swedenborg's word for it. Um, I don't think we should, actually. It should speak to us. Um, if it doesn't, then let's keep exploring. Um, but for, for uh, Swedenborg, I feel like this reality uh, is true for all people, not just ones who choose uh, it. And so we may have to wait till the afterlife to find out. But we don't have to just take his word for it because there are near-death experiences that are similar to Swedenborg's visions. In fact, if you read near-death experiences or, or watch them on YouTube, um, you know, I had one myself actually, that's what kind of turned me to spirituality after, you know, growing up without much faith. Hearing a lot about religion, my family is very religious in many different ways and, and my dad took it as his job to just learn about religion, right? And, and he liked to, to lecture about it. Um, but for me, I had no faith. It took that near-death experience to, to kind of wake me up, at least the beginning of it. And that's interesting because near-death experiences often convey similar things. Beings of light and warmth that convey love. We hear that often in uh, near-death experiences. We hear about that tunnel of light. And as you get closer to it, you feel this enveloping love, right? We're talking about heat and light being, you know, wisdom and love from Swedenborg hundreds of years ago, long before uh, there's any known publications, wide publications of near-death experiences. Um, here's Swedenborg kind of having uh, one that lasted a, a decade or two, telling us about these things and, and what they mean and similar things to what we read in NDEs. 
Now he writes, angels always face the Lord as the sun. Okay. Seems a little strange. How can they always face the Lord? But maybe we'll learn more. So south is on their right, north on their left, and west behind them. So even though they're in these communities and interacting with each other, in fact, in other books, he explores how angels convey information in these amazing ways, not just verbally, um, but also in that verb, verbal you know, communication, images arise. And um, they can say more in, in just a, a second or two than we can with paragraphs. So there's this real communication by the angels and then also with their auras and, and what have you. Um, but how, how could they be talking with each other in community and always have this sun in front of them? Well, it's a spiritual space. So it's a little trippy, you know. Uh, we talked about tripping earlier and how people have similar experiences in NDEs and with some psychedelics um, that are very therapeutic if taken reasonably, uh, according to many studies nowadays. Um, but Swedenborg believed this, this similarity um, was, was uh, key to why those experiences are so impactful for us. But even further, that if you're a true angel, that sun is always in your face or always before you. because That's because you're always facing the love and wisdom of God. Um, what's interesting, though, is that he talks about how people can perceive other people's bodies and, and environments very well. In fact, from long distances even. People who are of differing um, communities can connect with each other. Kind of like FaceTime today, or, or Skype, or, or Zoom, or what have you, um, or this, uh, funny enough. But, uh, you know, he's writing long before these things existed. So there's still spatial awareness. Um, and so we'll, we'll just have to take his word for it, I think, and, and just accept that it's a little trippy, <laughs> what Swedenborg's describing. He says, the, reasons, the reason angels constantly face the Lord as the sun is that angels are in the Lord, and the Lord is in them. The Lord exercises an inner guidance of their feelings and thoughts and constantly turns them toward himself. And indeed, that spiritual sun is always on the horizon, above the horizon, in front of them, um, in that angelic state. Now, what else does Swedenborg have to say from his visions of the afterlife and his deep wisdom uh, in spiritual matters? What's funny is that Swedenborg didn't spend his life cultivating spiritual wisdom and and there is a lot of wisdom, not just, you know, descriptions and explorations of the afterlife, uh, but also these deep, um, you know, practical things that he shares about meditative practices, about centering our hearts on compassion and consciousness and wisdom, um, you know, being kind of scientific about things, being, or at least wise about them, rational about them, and letting go of some of our deluded thinking. And so Swedenborg, uh, you know, he, he had all this wisdom, but throughout his life, it wasn't from his spiritual, uh, you know, his decades of spiritual study. He actually spent most of his life doing scientific research and exploration. Now, I think there was always some vein of spirituality, especially as he got older. Um, of course, his younger years were deeply entrenched in his father's um, Christianity, which was the Swedish church. Um, it's, it's considered to be, I believe, uh, Lutheran, but it's believed that he was a pietist, that his dad was a pietist. Uh, and so there is that interesting um, connection between Swedenborg and Protestantism in his own life. His dad was a bishop and a very well-known one. So he, he had a, a very Christian um, childhood, but you know, as he went through his years later, he he made all these discoveries about the brain, about uh, you know rational psychology and, and other things, um, and then all of a sudden he had this kind of spiritual experience, and and his spiritual eyes were open according to him, and the Lord, for specific reasons, started showing him um, sometimes directly, sometimes through angels, and just the awareness, spiritual awareness. Uh, the afterlife, the spiritual realm. And he says that's so that we know that it exists, uh, we know what it's like, and also that we know that the books in the Bible that follow this kind of um, symbolism, this parable-like 
nature that Jesus is said to always spoke from uh, were really scripture. They spoke to the internal realm within our hearts and minds. And the literal element, although important as kind of a covering or a base, wasn't the point, you know? And, and when we focus on the literal element of scripture, instead of seeing these deeper things, we can take it any way we want and, and misuse it for all kinds of bigotry as we've seen in history and other things. And he says that, that weirdness about misusing the literal nature of scripture is like the swords at the front of the Garden of Eden to the degree that we misuse scripture without looking deeper. Those swords that are flashing every which way um, keep us from that love, that peace and, and wisdom that we find deeper within scripture and deeper within ourselves. He writes, every kind of spirit turns toward her or his ruling love in the same way. So it's not just the son of the spiritual realm. We all do it um, in the afterlife. If we're in hell, if we're in the middle place called the world of spirits, according to Swedenborg, you know, kind of working our way to one or the other, uh, if we're in heaven, of course, um, the thing that we love the most, the symbol for it, whether it's the, you know, the spiritual sun um, or it's something dark and, and scary, which he considers to be kind of um, the representation of our selfishness. We turn towards it. We, we orient our spiritual bodies towards what we really love. He writes, I need to define angel and spirit. <laughs> Immediately after death, we come into a world of spirits that is halfway between heaven and hell. There, we work through our stretches of time or our states and are prepared either for heaven or for hell, depending on the way we have lived. As long as we stay in this world, we are called spirits. Anyone who has been brought up from this world into heaven is called an angel. And anyone who has been cast into hell is called a Satan or a devil. As long as we are in the world of spirits, people who are being readied for heaven are called angelic spirits. And people who are being readied for hell are called hellish spirits. All the while, angelic spirits are united to heaven and hellish spirits to hell. Um, he, he talks about being readied for hell. It's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, he describes it in some of his other books where, you know, based on kind of which way you lean, like if you keep turning towards that the selfishness and, and, and all these other tests and not really things that are meant to gruel us, but just, oh, what are you about? Like, what's going on with you? Um, you follow your interests and then eventually you work your way into heaven or into hell. Um, and interesting. And angels help that along. Other spirits help that along as well. All the spirits who are in the world of spirits are together with us because we are similarly between heaven and hell as to the deeper levels of our minds. Through these spirits, we are in touch with either heaven or hell, depending on the way we are living. Okay, so we're in a similar state now. We're in deep connection with spirits and heaven and hell um, today. So maybe that's part of the reason learning about these things can help us take our inner life seriously and also have a little better understanding, a little better light um, when it comes to what's going on and, and how we can uh, lean into divinity, lean into our intrinsic love, compassion, and awareness. Further, uh, he writes a little later, something also needs to be said about love since we are talking about how angels and spirits turn toward their loves because of their loves. Heaven as a whole is laid out in communities depending on all the differences in loves. So is hell, and so is the world of spirits. Heaven, though, is laid out in communities according to differences in heavenly loves, while hell is laid out in communities according to differences in hellish loves. And the world of spirits is laid out in communities according to differences in both heavenly and hellish loves. There are two loves that are at the head of all the rest, and two loves that lie behind all the rest. The head of all heavenly loves, the love basic to them all, is love for the Lord. The head of all hellish loves, or the love that underlies them all, is a love of controlling, prompted by self-love. These two loves are absolute opposites. So I get that love for the Lord, as he explores in other places, is love for all the things that God's about, not just the word, the Lord, <laughs> you know, not just a historical, the Lord, 
but what God is actually about, you know, uplifting the oppressed, all that care and compassion that Jesus conveyed. We also hear emphasize very heavily in Buddhism and other traditions. Um, and then hell, at least the, the key love of hell, is controlling prompted by self-love. So I, I think that's a good caveat, that controlling impulse within ourselves um, is a, a key thing, key love of hell, um, prompted by self-love. So interesting. Okay, moving on. The divine love and wisdom that emanate from the Lord as the sun and constitute heaven's warmth and light is the emanating divinity that is the Holy Spirit. He says, I explain in the teachings of the, for the new Jerusalem on the Lord that God is one in both person and essence, consisting of a trinity, and that this God is the Lord. I also explain that his trinity is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Divinity as source is the Father, divinity as human is the Son, and divinity as emanating is the Holy Spirit. So he's saying God is one being, not three persons. And, and But he says there's a reason why we thought so, is the scriptures use these different terms to describe God. Um, and it's talking about different aspects of God. And so let's read more about what those are. We say divinity as emanating, and yet no one knows why we say emanating. The reason for this ignorance is that people have not known before that the Lord looks like a sun to angels, and that from that sun there issues a warmth that is essentially divine love and a light that is essentially divine wisdom. As long as this remains unknown, people cannot help knowing that divinity is emanating as intrinsic divinity because it says in the Athanasian doctrine of the Trinity that the Father is one person, the Son another, and the Holy Spirit another. I note that he, he quotes knowing about this because, um, you know, he doesn't, he's not quite on that level, right? Now that we know that the Lord looks like a son, though, we can have an appropriate image of the divinity as emanating. That is called the Holy Spirit. We can realize that while it is one with the Lord, it emanates from him the way warmth and light emanate from the sun. This is also why angels are in divine warmth and light to the extent that they are caught up in love and wisdom. So saying this Holy Spirit is that light and warmth with us. Um, interesting, okay. It's, it's fascinating to me because I know in scripture it says the Holy Spirit was not yet because Christ had not been glorified. And so we hear in scripture the story of Christ and Swedenborg believed that, yes, Jesus was the whole of divinity, but had to overcome these temptations to divine his body, divine his human nature, his, his more earthly mind. Um, and that was the process that's often talked about in scripture, the glorification process. It's also why we see Jesus sometimes um, very, like, you know, humble and, and humiliated and, and things like that, and then also glorified is this process of letting go of the more human or finite human elements uh, from his family uh, and taking on bigger you know the divine human elements from his spirit from himself uh, from the intrinsic consciousness of his being and so the holy spirit in that sense isn't coming from christ yet until his humanity is glorified. Now moving a bit further into this book. It's a great book, folks, but sometimes I know people find it a little dense. Uh, so I, I hope you enjoy jumping through it uh, as I have and, and learning a little bit more about Swedenborgianism and some of the fundamental things that he thinks about when he's talking about God and about all life and, and being. The physical world sun is nothing but fire and is therefore dead. And since nature has its origin in that sun, nature <laughs> is dead. So, you know, he's making the point that, at least relative to the spiritual realm, everything in the natural realm, if it's not like living, living, it's dead. And even our physical bodies and, and what have you are relatively 
dead or transient because they do die and we move on. Um, the true reality, of course, in its greatest sense is divinity, that consciousness that everything is speaking to and that God is pulling us towards. Um, you know, and so uh, it's interesting that he, he points this out because he also says that God is in everything. He makes everything. But I think it's a relative thing, right? Like physical reality, especially wood, you know, or maybe not wood as much as rock or light uh, isn't technically living even in our point of view. Uh, so it's relatively dead, according to Swedenborg. Since the lowest elements of nature that constitute our soils are dead are not and not varied and changeable in response to our states of feeling and thought the way they are in the spiritual world, but are unchangeable and stable, we have space and various spatial distances here. They have this stable nature because this is where creation comes to a close and remains at rest. We can see from this that space is proper to nature, and since space here is not an appearance of space responsive to states of life, the way it is in the spiritual world, we can refer to it as dead. So that's him kind of expanding, okay, all these things are dead, uh, you know, in, in terms of his definition of it, um, because they're not really speaking to spiritual life. They're, they're more stable, you know, they don't change because we've changed in our, our hearts. Uh, and so I think we get a good idea of what he values, too, and what he thinks the point of the universe is. It's about life. It's about consciousness. Um, as you become removed from that, uh, it's less, less living, and he even says it, it behaves less living. It's not as responsive. It, it's more dead. All right. Well, thanks, Swedenborg, for, for that one. I, I find it an uh, interesting connection to... Um, you know, Buddhism and, and some other philosophies that are, are similar uh, to Buddhism. Uh, because, of course, in that philosophy, you know, many of their sages talk about realizing that everything around us is an illusion, is, is dead, and that we should be centered on the greater consciousness that isn't so caught up in distracted thinking um, and, and what, what's going on externally. Now, it, we should turn towards compassion in everything we do, according to Buddhism, and definitely according to Swedenborg. We should be helpful, we should be useful, but we should center our consciousness on the, the wider consciousness. It's not chatting, you know, it's not um, yearning, it's not desiring, it's not asking questions. That's often what our mind does. Um, Buddhism says, no, that, that is your mind, it's a tool, it's, it's still going to be there, um, but we should stop kind of giving it the place of the head or, or giving it an audience and turn towards greater things. And in fact, Swedenborg talks very similarly when he talks about selfishness um, and, and mind in that regard, that we should stop giving it the head. We should move it, move it to its rightful place as a tool, realizing that it's not us, that we watch our thoughts. We even are, you know, we watch ourselves and we come to define ourselves as this body, as these thoughts, but we're actually just the experiencing. We're something greater. Um, and that greater consciousness is closer to the root of, of all being, um, God, that light, that wisdom, that warmth that both Buddhism and Swedenborg say um, we should center in as well because no relaxed, meditative, you know, aware state uh, shouldn't center itself in anything but compassion, according to many Buddhist sages. So it's, it's a cool connection. And I think there's good reason why Swedenborg was called the Buddha of the North, um, you know, partly due to things like that. And now we're heading towards the end of this section, folks. So uh, thanks for joining in today. Um, he, he's, he's an interesting character, Swedenborg is, and, and I know we all are. Uh, but I, it just dumbfounds me, actually, that he speaks to us on, on such a level today from hundreds of years ago. So I really appreciate you connecting uh, with me in this. And, and please follow and subscribe if you enjoy this. You know, our, our messages are different. Our sermons are, are very different than some of our book talks or our 201 and 101 classes as well. Um, so you'll get a variety here. Uh, explore and uh, share your thoughts, share your feedback as you, you connect. He writes, the goal of creation, that everything should return to the creator and that there should be a union 
becomes manifest in outermost forms. I love it. He just inserts the point of life <laughs> in this like short phrase and, and, and makes some other point in the same sentence. Uh, I'm sure he explores it more, you know, later, maybe even earlier on, but it, it's just cool because Swedenborg, you know, he felt like he knew. He, he felt like he knew the point of the universe is for God to um, collect everyone in, you know, closer and closer as time as time goes on. Of course, God is outside of time, but we we experience time, at least we think we do, or, or changes of state. Um, and the point of the universe is for God to share God with other people, with other beings, um, you know. And that's a real, like in a real way, in, in terms of the love and wisdom that is the, the most immediate thing that God conveys, that God is. Um, so it's, it's cool that Swedenborg had that clarity of vision. It makes sense to me as well. He writes, throughout the created universe, in its largest and smallest instances alike, we find these three, purpose, means, and result. You know, I'm reminded of, you know, like a, a fifth grade or seventh grade science class, you know, cause and effect or what have you. Uh, the reason we find them in the largest and smallest instances of the created universe is that these three are in God the Creator, purpose, means, and results, who is the Lord from eternity, since He is infinite, though, and since in one who is infinite, there are infinite things in a distinguishable oneness. These three are a distinguishable oneness in him and in the infinite things that belong to him. So he's saying God's infinite. You know, kind of like you're, you know, you're pretty expansive yourself. You got a lot going on. <laughs> but some of those things I can define. They're distinguishable. You know, you think about being a parent, you think about this or that, you are about this or that, you do this or that, etc. Right? Uh, you're you're, you have a human body, and, you know, and on. Uh, so he's saying, okay, in God, there are these three things, and they're actually connected kind of, kind of like in an experiment, purpose, means, and ends, or results. Um, and they're distinguishable in God and God's infiniteness, but they make a one. And he says, this is why the universe being created from his reality, and if we look at its functions, being an image of him, retains these three in each of its constituent details. Okay, so he's saying everything in the universe is similar in having these three things. And we see it actually in, in atoms, for example, right? We have the neutrons, um, and then that brings the electrons and the protons. And is the purpose a neutral state, perhaps? I mean, that's why electrons and protons come together. They create a neutral state that's a, a bigger version of itself. Um, and that can do more and more complicated things, right? So we, we kind of see it in our physics. Um, and he says, you know, you can see it in science. You can see it in, you know, experiments, how, how plant life works and, and on and on. I'll also note here that he uses him for God. And of course, he, he naturally does this to some degree because of his deep belief in Christ as the incarnation of, of God. But he also explores how God is all beingness um, and inclusive of male and female and all genders, all aliens, you know, all beings uh, in their goodness and health. And that all of us are in God when we're in heaven. It's not that part of, you know, women or, or part of whatever person is outside of heaven in the next life. Women are in heaven, men are in heaven, um, you know, the, the diversity of beings are in heaven. And so he uses him partly due to the tradition and, and the times. The grand purpose or the purpose of all elements of creation is an eternal union of the creator with the created universe. So again, he emphasizes the purpose of the universe. And I do remember that in some of the Latin, he uses creatrix. So he uses a female version of creator in some of the Latin. So some of this could also be our translations as well. Um, he says, this does not happen unless there are subjects in which his divinity can be at home, so to speak. Subjects in which it can dwell and abide. For these subjects to be his dwellings and homes, they must be receptive of his love and wisdom, apparently of their own accord. Subjects who will, with apparent autonomy, raise themselves toward the Creator and unite themselves with him 
In the absence of this reciprocity, there is no union. So it seems to ourselves that we're doing it ourselves. There's autonomy, we have freedom, and it's from our own strength, you know, bootstraps and what have you. But in reality, it's God helping us. Of course, it's community helping us often as well. Um, but it will seem like we're working on it on our own. And that's partly because we're meant to feel that ownership, that acceptance of the love and wisdom that we receive as part of us. Um, but in the deeper awareness that it's actually from divinity and shared with all beings. He further writes, creation is constantly pressing toward this final goal by means of this trio of purpose, means, and result. Because these three elements are in God the Creator, as just stated. Further, divinity is in all space non-spatially, as, as we talked about earlier in the, the last video, and is the same in the largest and smallest things. We can see from this that the entire creation in its general tending toward its final goal is the intermediate end, relatively speaking. So he's saying creation is actually like part of, in, in a bigger kind of general way, this intermediate end. It, it has, it, it also has, you know, purpose, means, and results, but it's an intermediate end. It, it serves as greater um, end as well. God the Creator is constantly drawing up out of the earth forms of service in their sequence, a sequence that culminates in us who are from the earth as far as our bodies are concerned. By accepting love and wisdom from the Lord, we are then raised up and furnished with all the means for the acceptance of love and wisdom. Moreover, we are so created that we can accept them if we are only willing to. Hmm. If we are only willing to. And I think that's a good phrase to end on, folks. If we are only willing to lean into love and wisdom, God's warmth and light, uh, we may become a beacon for the world, a, a small spiritual sun, so to speak, one of those angelic beings, as many near-death experiences describe, that emanate love and um, wisdom. And we can be that for other people. But I think it's you know kind of keying back into what he said earlier, that uh, tendency to control out of self-love that we should be the most aware of. We can't just change it in ourselves, but as we become aware, connecting back into that intrinsic compassion and, and awareness, um, we can let go of some of those habits because they're not really us. It's a deluded, it's, it's not only from a deluded state, like a deluded point of view, you know, there is a self and I, I, sh I deserve everything, etc. Um, but it also is a deluded state because it's transient and it has no grounding in God. God isn't like that at all. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a cool way to wrap up uh, that section of divine love and wisdom. We'll, we'll jump back in one more time, not exploring uh, every, you know, nook and cranny of this book. Some of it's uh, pretty detailed, pretty, you know, you know, take some time to... to digest and, and understand. So I invite you to read it yourself. Uh, you can download it for free in uh, the description of this video, uh, at least on YouTube. And you can also find it at SwedenborgianCommunity.org under our free book section. Um, you know, Swedenborg, thank you for giving, uh, you know, this uh, insightful work of art, of creation, of thoughtfulness. Thank you, God, for speaking to us however you have today. And thank you uh, you for connecting, sharing, and connecting uh, with others, uplifting their warmth and light. Bye.